So this is the Intern Whisper. My name is Isabella Johnston. I am the host of the show, and our show is brought to you by Employers for Change. Um, this week's guest is Sean Pinnock. He's the CEO of Avalon. He is a human, which is a human-centric game studio that creates Meta. He's going to tell us all about it, but it is a VR experience. He has expert, extensive expertise in working in the technology and gaming industry, and he has served as a member of the board of directors for his previous company, CyberDream, and also as a technical designer with EA. And for those that don't know what that is, that's Electronic Arts, and also with Microsoft. So there's so much more to you than just what I read. And I'm really excited to have you here as a guest, Sean. So thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Ah, well, this, just so you know, no pressure, but I think you're a huge thought leader in our industry here in Orlando, Florida. So this is going to be highlighting all of the best of everything that you know and you can share with us. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Um, I just like making cool stuff. So thanks. I know. Fun <laughs> stuff, right? Cool and fun yeah. stuff. Yeah. So what would be your five words that you would use to describe you if you're talking to somebody? What are your five words? Mm. Yeah, so um, I would say determination, um, kindness, entrepreneurship, um, empathy, and creativity. All right, so let's go over that list. You know, sure. you can go in any order that you want, but why those five words? Yeah, I mean, they each describe a different part of myself. Um, you know, determination uh, because, you know, and life. For me, at least, you know, to be successful, you just have to be determined. You have to you have to be resilient. Uh, you have to have a lot of um, guts to keep going, and that's been a huge part of who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, as as a as a person and as a businessman and as a you know as a husband um, and as a father, uh, that's a huge part of my life. Um, kindness, because you know, life's short, and I think that you know, we all need to do our part to make this world a little bit better. And I, I think that being kind is really important. Um, you know, when, when capable, um, there's an old saying that the true judge of a person is based on what they do with power. And, and now that I'm in a position of authority, I, I still like to, to use that position of authority in a way that's kind. Um, creativity, because in essence, I believe humans, we're all creative. And that's a part of myself. I, I always, aim to foster and ultimately is I think why I do a lot of why I do, of what I do because I'm, I want to express myself creatively um, empathy because I think that the world is a very complex place and humans are very complex people and it's very easy to I think take your personal upbringing and your personal understanding of the world and not um, be understanding of other people and so I, I do my best to strive to understand other people and then entrepreneurship because I am a I am a I would say independent soul I have a hard time following the, the, the beaten path I like to explore I like to wander I like to imagine and I have a hard time doing that under other people's leadership so I've, I've typically done so on my own um, where it's where I'm best able to express those other characteristics about myself so that's those are those are my why to my five words. That's really uh, very insightful, and I guess that's where you got some of that wisdom from having worked with certainly Microsoft and also EA. You know, the bigger the companies get, they always tout that they're very creative. They're creative environments. They hire creatives. That's you know the main staple word that they always use. But they all had to start as a small company to be able to become a giant. So is that one of your dreams too, is to become a giant company? Um, I don't know that one of my dreams is to become a giant company, but I would say it's to make a giant impact on the world in a positive way. Um, yeah, speaking to my experience working at bigger companies, they do hire creative people, but oftentimes um, your ability to be creative in those companies is quite constrained uh, at ea they had a, a saying which was you know work in your swim lane and i i quite literally 
got in a lot of trouble for doing, for working on things, being creative in ways that was out of my swim lane. And when you're at a company with tens of thousands of people, your swim lane is about that big. So yes. not a whole lot of room for creativity, yeah. uh, depending on your job role. So very, very, very true. <laughs> Lots of varies in that statement that I just made. Yeah. So where did you go to school? And then mm -hmm. how did you end up with where you are now? Because we really want to talk here a lot about um, Meta and where you got that name. And then same with Cyber Dream. How did that name come about? But like, where'd you go to school? Yeah, so I went to school, um, you know, University of Central Florida. I'm a third generation of Floridian. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I wanted to stay with my family and my friends, and we were all here. It made sense for me to, to stay here. Um, I actually founded the game development um, student-run organization while I was at, attending UCF. I actually grew to be one of the largest student-run organizations in the country. We did work with like Microsoft and um, Epic Games and a whole lot of other people. It was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I went to school there. And you know, Aval Avalon's name of our company, which has a lot of inspiration from from Meta. Um, I got the name Avalon, you know, from a, a lot of a lot of thinking went into it. But uh, when we think about um, an, an oasis, if you've read Ready Player One, Oasis, or you think about you know the metaverse from Neil Stevenson's book. It's this idea of a land or a place that's almost mythical. And there's a number of places like that in mythology and in literature. You have, you know, Zion from the Jewish religion, you have heaven from, you know, uh, the English religion or English uh, Christianity. You have, um, you know, Valhalla. Um, but th this idea of, a, of, a, of an oasis or heavenly place is spread throughout literature. And in Arthurian legend, it's Avalon. It's the, right. it's the place where all heroes go when they die. And I thought, you know, when I think about, you know, Arthurian legend, when I think about Pendragon, it's it's one of the staples, I think, in, in you know, the creative Western hemisphere. And it also is a name that people can easily say and <laughs> wasn't taken. So um, I also, um, anecdotally went to a school called Avalon, a private school called Avalon. So there were a number of things that uh, made sense for it. And then also another interesting tidbit is Avalon is the oldest still running massive multiplayer video game. Um, wow. And we acquired them. Um, they're small. Most people haven't heard of them. It's, it's a Avalon Online. But we acquired them um, after we started this company. So there was a lot of things just lined up that made sense for Avalon. So yeah, that's how we came up with the name. Yeah, I know Avalon. I was an English major, so I know yeah. Avalon comes from, like you said, you know, King Arthur. Most of the people will recognize it from there, but they may not have known all of the other information. But I want to take one step back. Are you part of the group or are you the person that created the Game Dev Nights at UCF? That club? Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the CEO and founder of Game Dev Nights, yeah. Or not wow. CEO founder, sorry. I'm the, the president of the uh, CEO, the president and founder of Game of Nights. And I'm actually the, was the vice president and co-founder of Gaming Nights. So. so are you, do they have a board? Are you still on that board? Are you active? There's, there's no, uh, so there's a, you know, an elected student body. Um, there's no board. It, you know, it's a nonprofit organization. Um, I'm still, an, I would say an advisor in, an, in a non-official capacity. I, I meet with and often mentor um, the students that are running that organization, but I'm not actively involved. Um, gotcha. Well, that's quite a, a big accolade to have is to be the person that created that because UCF, we all know it's ranked second in the country for being one of the, the largest schools in the country. Um, and to have that club, I mean, that wasn't probably that long ago. You're pretty young. It's, it's 2015. I mean, it, it feels not that long ago for me, but gosh, I guess it's been eight years. Uh, yeah. yeah, 20, 2015, I'm back in 2014, even I can't remember. Um, but yeah, I guess it's been a little bit now, you know, a lot of the people that went through that organization too, have done really well. I know a lot of people that have gone off to be, you know, creative directors and senior producers on, you know, games like Fortnite and, you know, meta and places like that. So it's, it's been pretty cool to see, you know, at the time when we, when we started that organization, it was just a bunch of kids that needed a place to like hang out and make video games. <laughs> yeah. Like literally the first event was in my mother's basement. And um, you know, we were just hanging out making video games together. And um now it's become like kind of a big thing, I guess, mm -hmm. at least at least locally, right? So 
Yeah. And so your first job was that at Microsoft when you graduated from school. And what was your major, by the way? I don't so know. It was game design. It was game design and um, and, uh, and computer science undergrad. But no, actually, um, my first job was uh, not a job. Um, I, I graduated college and I really wanted to work at Riot or Blizzard. And um, I actually was interviewing with um, both of them at the time. And a friend of mine and I were working on a video game together called Black Sea Odyssey. And um, I told him that, hey, you know, if you get a publishing deal, I'll stop looking for work and we'll make Black Sea Odyssey together. And I didn't think he'd get one. And then like three weeks later, he got one. And so I stopped my interviews. I don't know if I ever would have got one of those jobs, but uh, stopped my interviews and uh, we decided to make a game together. So that was my first foray. And then after that is when I jumped into the industry and started working at this other company. So, hmm. yeah. So Microsoft, we know it is a global giant. EA, you know, I, I don't know. It's definitely not as big as Microsoft, but maybe it is. I, I'm not sure. But those are really big companies and cool names to have on your CV for sure. Um, when did you decide to jump into the entrepreneur world? Yeah, so, you know, I had worked on that game independently for about a year and a half. And um, when it came out, it was, I would say, modestly successful. We thought we were going to, like, to be blunt, we thought we were going to make a ton of money. We thought we'd made the best game ever. And I think we were a little naive at the time. Um, and we were, we were modestly successful. And um, I would say being modestly successful in that situation when we had worked, you know, 70 hour weeks for, for a couple of years, we were disappointed. And um, we decided to go, you know, get jobs. And um, I worked in AAA for a bit, making AAA games. And I really became demoralized, you know, working in AAA, like I was talking about before, there wasn't much room for creative expression. And I, I frankly, I hated it. Um, I didn't like it. I didn't like, I didn't like being a small cog in a big machine and I, I needed to be an entrepreneur again. So I, um, I left, I think EA was where I was at the time. I left EA and I was working on uh, frostbite, working on Madden and, um, decided to start cyber dream. I saw VR was really becoming popular. And I thought that there was a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to make, um, awesome games that hadn't been made before in the space. And so I started, um, cyber dream and then decided to go make a virtual reality battle royale which was a little ambitious <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah so cyber dream how did that name come about yeah so um you know i've been a big dreamer my whole life um both literally and metaphorically you know i've, I've had a lot of very weird dreams that give me a lot of creative inspiration um especially throughout my childhood and I've been a dreamer and that I've been very ambitious as well and have grand dreams in life. And then cyber sounds kind of cool and it's digital and those two things put together and, and then you throw VR on there as well. And it kind of just makes sense. So um, yeah, that's how cyber dream came about. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Avalon. Um, and when you, when did you start that company and you've been somebody that was successful in raising money for it. So let's talk about that entrepreneurial journey. And also yeah. what is it that uh, is the launch date? When are we going to be able to play with it and all of that good stuff? Yeah. So um, backing up a little bit, I've, I've had a dream of, or the dream of an oasis or, you know, an, an Avalon, an alternate reality, a, a greater reality for a long time, as long as I can remember. And, um, you know, when I was building Cyber Dream, I actually really wanted to build Avalon. And um, you know, I started building Virtual Battlegrounds, thinking it would be the first game in, in a series of games that would get me to Avalon. And I was pitching constantly while I was building um, Virtual Battlegrounds. And I was very unsuccessful. Um, I spent five years pitching while building uh, Virtual Battlegrounds. And um, wasn't able to do it. And it's because I was frankly unknown as an entrepreneur. You know, I hadn't had any success under my belt. Um, I hadn't worked in the industry that long and I needed a lot of money to build the thing. Now that all changed when I released Virtual Battlegrounds because I'd proven that I could bootstrap a company, ship a product and be successful with it. It was actually one of the best selling VR games in 2020. I also built a um, you know contracting business over the course of five or six years. So I was making a fair amount of revenue from, from contracting, building stuff for like Lockheed and NASA. So eventually I exited the company in 2021, had a, a modestly successful exit. And 
the market was really booming around this idea that I had been thinking about and pitching for so long. And it just happened. It was right place, right time. And it made it, I don't want to say easy because it wasn't easy because of the five works I'd put into leading up to it. But when I started pitching Avalon in 2021, it was easy um, because of all the time and energy and I put into it leading up to that. Um, in terms of our roadmap, you know, we just finished our vertical slice, which is a major, if you're looking at the image behind me, that's Avalon. Mm -hmm. uh, Avalon, in a nutshell, is a massive multiplayer online game with user-generated content and a virtual economy, but people can build stuff like what you're seeing behind me. In fact, this is a scene that our community can build pretty quickly. Um, and uh, we're targeting early access Q3, Q4 next year. So if you're wow. interested, yeah, if you're interested, check us out on socials, just at Avalon, you'll, you'll find us. So, and then you can, you can follow us. See all well, the, I know all the stuff we've been working on. your website is play Avalon, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, playavalon.com is our website. Yep. Yeah. So they would have to go there if they want to go to the website, but at Avalon, mm -hmm. you mean the at symbol, right? Yeah. So just, if you go to Twitter at Avalon, uh, LinkedIn.com slash, I think it's play Avalon on LinkedIn. And then uh, most likely if you're listening to this website, it's playavalon.com, but our, our public facing game website is going to be avalon.online. Um, which hasn't gone live yet, and but it should go live in a few months. So, well, that's okay because even though we're recording this and it's going to be releasing, just so you know, in January, January thirtieth, it might be out there by then. Probably a month or two after, yeah, February, March, probably the one that's going to go live. So yeah. All right, so yeah. that's something they have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like to fundraise for this? Um. You know, again, like I, I had been raising for a long time. And so I'd, I'd gotten quite used to rejection. I think as an entrepreneur you in general, to. you have to get used to rejection because you have to fail a hundred times in order to succeed once. And, you know, when it, when it came time to pitch Avalon, I had, I had done the, the 10,000 repetitions and I had had a product, I had a product, I'd had a vision. I, I knew I'd been the, you know, done all of the things and all the steps. And so it was kind of like a finally moment you know, like, a, hey, look, this is real now. This is happening. Um, and it was very, I would say, exhilarating. And then after, uh, stressful. Um, because it's like, oh, amazing. You know, finally raised money to build this thing and raised more money than I was expecting to raise. You know, we raised $13 million. I was expecting to maybe raise six or seven. And, um, you know, realizing that <clears throat> you've got all this money and now you have a, a thing that you promised to do and have to go do it. It's, it's, it, was, it was stressful. Um, uh, it was stressful, not, not in a bad way, but it was, it was scary. You know, there were a few nights mm -hmm. where I remember I was just, you know, in my, in, in a bathtub, just like, you know, thinking, oh my God, like it's time. We're going to go build this thing. Like it's real. And um, that was, that was a big deal. So mm -hmm. it yeah. is. And what's always amazing is it sounds like so much money, but when you're doing anything, I think in games and movie and movies and software, it's like hardly any money is, is what we end up realizing <laughs> so quickly. I don't yeah. know. That's not what I'm asking you to reveal, but you know, it's just like, it sounds like it's a lot of money. I mean, there's, there's truth to that. I mean, I, I had been boot, bootstrapping businesses for a while, so I'm got quite good at building a lot with a little, but um, you know, with Avalon, it was kind of another ball game. It's like I had gone from the minor leagues to the major leagues. And there's a lot more costs involved when you get to the major leagues, because now you're talking about hiring experienced, talented developers and to pull them from their cushy jobs at Microsoft and Electronic Arts, you got to pay them well. And so the, it does it, it, it does add up quick. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, Baldur's Gate 3, a game we all love, took $200 million in six years to make. It's because making great games is expensive. Now, you can do a lot with less than a lot of companies can, but $13 million when making something like an Oasis isn't a lot of money. Um, but we're, we are, I would say more agile than most too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you think when the game launches? Um, what is the expectation? I mean, I'm sure you guys have goals of how you want it to expand. And is this, this is a global game, I would assume, right? It's a global game. Yeah. 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 It's a global game. We're intending to eventually reach all platforms, console, web, uh, mobile, uh, PC, of course. Um, we'd, we'd like to have a, I'm not going to give numbers in this call, but let's just say we want to make a big splash, but we don't need to make the biggest splash. We don't need to be Fortnite on day one, but we want to be a, a reputable 
you know, game that, that stands amongst other AAA games. And then we'd like to grow. We'd like to grow from there because it's really about the long tail with Avalon. It's about not just when we release, but 10 years after we release. It's about mm -hmm. users building content alongside us and us building content with our users. Um, we'd like to grow to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest game in the world, but that's not going to happen on day one. Um, I would say, you know, 10 million users would be a very successful, a very successful, even 5 million users would be a very successful launch. Um, and then that number will go down as retention rates typically do, but then we can grow that number. And then yeah. we could be something um, huge in 10 years. That, that's our intention, our goal, I should say. Well, I think you need to get a lot of t-shirts out there and a lot <laughs> of stickers and start distributing that among, I don't know, probably high schools, colleges, wherever it is that the perfect demographic is. Um, certainly, you know, any of the game jams or, you know, being active in those communities, Discord. Uh, would be helpful but like people need to see it and then they will remember it more than even just the words right so we have to have a big launch before it happens just swamp the market with shirts I love what you're saying let's just give everyone a shirt <laughs> yeah. but no I don't it, know if it works that way but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that probably won't be uh you know our primary I would say, go to market uh, strategy but um, we do want to build community alongside us. We actually, one of the things we're going to start doing as part of early access is inviting cr uh, creators to come in and play and, and build with us. Mm -hmm. Um, cause it's really all about, you know, empowering a creator economy and then people coming in and playing all the cool stuff that the people are making. So I think getting involved with game developers around the world is a, is a great approach, especially high schoolers and college folks and other people that, um, you know, have the time and the energy and, and, and maybe not the skills yet to make games um, independently. Yeah. So that means it's going to be more op open source in some of your development? Yeah. So Avalon, um, you know, we have a saying at Avalon and it's that creating should feel like playing. I think one of the things that UGC platforms today get wrong is that they're, they're too difficult. I mean, even Roblox, certainly Fortnite's creative mode, um, they're hard. They're really hard to make games on. You know, people don't want to write JavaScript. People don't want to write Lua. They don't want to learn all of the very complicated tooling that's required to make these games. And in Avalon, um, you know, we're building tools that are really part of the core game experience uh, so that you know, creating a, an application or creating a new game mode is, is just like you're playing a video game. It's very easy, it's very seamless. So, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all, it's all open mm -hmm. for a community to build. Well, what is your favorite media that you like to consume information if it's in the game community? You know, are you like a Twitch guy? Are you, I don't know if people are that, that, that active on it, but where do you get podcasts, games? What do you do? You know, kind of all over the place. Um, I, you know, I watch, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. Um, I, I read a lot, read a lot of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I, I read some you know, physical form, but I like to listen to audiobooks. I can go to the gym and do them at the same time or be on a drive or on an airplane. Um, I play a lot of video games. You know, every every new game that comes out, I usually play it, every big one, especially a lot of the indie games too. Not every game, right? There's a bajillion in games that come out, but most of the games that everyone's heard of, I've played all of them. Uh, I watch anime, TV. I'm, I'm a major consumer of media, I would say, in entertainment. <laughs> yeah, that gives you a lot of inspiration, I'm sure. Definitely. Yeah. So if, if you're doing that, what is your favorite book? Do you have a book that you, maybe you're working on a book. I don't know. It could be any kind of thing, but do you have a favorite book that you go to for your leadership? For, for leadership? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have, you know, I have multiple favorite books um, depending on, you know, the, the genre that it is that we're thinking of. Um, I thought Atomic Habits was one of the best books for productivity, not for leadership necessarily. Um, you know, I've read a number of books on leadership, and I really don't have one that stands out to me as the best one. There was one I think Simon Sinek wrote, I thought was Leaders Eat Last. I thought that was mm -hmm. fairly good. Um, a number of principles in there I thought um, were, were quite good. One of the core concepts I really recall from that book um, that I resonate with was, you know, the problem we have in big corporations today, like why don't why don't people respect the CEO at these big companies? And it's because um, they're so abstracted, I think, from the rest of the business. And what I mean by that is you know, you're working at a company like Microsoft or, or pick your company and you, you, know, you don't 
there's no connection between you and that person. Whereas if you look back at, you know, human civilization, the leader of your tribe was someone who led the charge, right? It was like, oh, hey, we're going to go hunting today to feed all of our families. And that person was the first one to jump out and attack the boar, right? And um, a bit of a weird analogy, but thinking back into Avalon, um, that's how I run my business, right? Like if, if I'm like, hey guys, you know, we need to get a lot of, a lot of work done this week. You're going to see me putting in more commits than anyone else in the company, you know, uh, on that week and, and code because I'm leading the charge, right? I'm, I'm not going to tell you to do a thing. I'm not going to do myself. Now you won't see me um, drawing any beautiful pictures because that's not what I'm good at. But um, the thing I am good at is, is writing code. So that, that's how I contribute. Uh, so I really enjoyed that book. Um, but there's a number of other, you know, things like I, I really love uh, Wheel of Time. It's, it's one of my favorite. Um, I don't, I don't like the movie. I think the movies, are too, the TV show is terrible, but the book show or the, um, the books are incredible. It's one of my favorite reads as a kid. Loved Harry Potter as well. Um, I don't think it's as mature though. Dune was a lot of fun. I liked Hyperion more than Dune though. If we're going to go science fiction. So, yeah. mm -hmm. um, favorite game that you like to play and relax with and play with friends. Um, so asking me like what my favorite game is, is really difficult. It's hard. I've, I've played like probably 38,000 hours of video games and it's, it's kind of, yeah, um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but a lot of my waking hours have been spent behind a computer screen or console playing video games. But, um, <clears throat> Witcher 3 is one of my all time favorite games. Uh, I love Warcraft and Starcraft, but lately I've been playing a lot of, I love some people like this, but I've been playing a lot of League of Legends and TFT. A lot of my friends are on there. Um, auto chess has been kind of a way for me to just like turn my brain off and like sort of play a video game while like being a dad or something else. I've been doing some of that. So I've been playing TFT and some of those other games are auto auto play games lately. Hmm. Auto chess. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, I'm trying to learn. I'm going to have to rephrase that. I'm going to learn how to play chess. I've never played it. I didn't know there was an option to go for auto. I've got the app and I was going, okay, I'll move well, here. The auto chess is, um, it's not chess as, as you oh. think it, it's a, yeah, they call it auto chess, but it's, um, it's just a new style of game where you pick characters and the characters like do battle for you, but there's like, they call it auto chess because there's chess like decision making. Okay. Um, in the way you play, but there's, there's no, it's not literally chess. Yeah. Oh, well that's <laughs> deceiving, but I, I do, think... I do play a bit of chess. I'm not very good, but, um, <laughs> I do play a bit of chess. Okay, so teach your kids how to play chess for sure. I wish yeah. my parents had done that with me, but man, yeah. you know, going back, you know, board games are good too. It doesn't have to always be video games. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Hardest lesson that you learned that you think changed your life for the better? Let's say for the better. Hmm. Hardest lesson that I learned that I think changed my life for the better. Um, I think getting comfortable with failure. Like the, in in life, um, you know, I think we all have ambitions, things that we want, and sometimes you know we fall short. And you know, there's been a number of times in my life when I wanted a thing and wasn't able to get that thing. But I think that it's made me a better person. Um, I'm certainly a more humble person and a more I would say empathetic person. Um, so yeah, there's been a, there's been a few times I've wanted something and failed, and um, have grown stronger from it so without being was, specific yeah i was thinking you're going to say being a father <laughs> that's a hard thing but it's giving you i'm sure a lot of joy <laughs> being a father certainly has made my life uh, better too and that's been a hard thing yeah uh, my my wife morgan though has made it less hard um yeah yeah and i bet you have a different relationship with your own parents i i know that I think that would be true for everybody is that once you have kids, you sit here and you got to go back to your parents and say, man, I'm really so sorry <laughs> for whatever it is that we did. Cause we always do stupid stuff as kids, you know, you get to experience that with your own kids. Let's see here. Yeah. Who in your life has had the biggest impact? Uh, my, my wife, Morgan. Um, definitely. Yeah. She's, she's, we've been together now for, um, for you know gosh since 2010 almost 13 years she's, she's been like a partner time. to me yeah, yeah she's she's been a partner to me i certainly wouldn't be i would say you know kindness to being one of my five virtues if it wasn't for her you know that that may not be the case so. mm -hmm. uh my last question before we take a break is what would you want to be remembered for in your life mm. making the world a little bit better 
than when I got here. So yeah, and that's a that's a very broad statement, right? But you know, doing that through a game, it may seem to some people is like, well, how can that? But you can give people joy. You can teach people. There's so many things that come right. from I mean, you know, playing games. When we talk about you know the hardest thing in my life, there was a time you know when when I was going through failure, and um, I was thinking like why like why am I here like like what's the point of this and you know I realized I just wanted to be happy, and then and then ultimately like I wanted to make other people happy too, and so that's why I got into making video games because for me it was a way to give people joy. Um, so yeah, if I can make something that makes a lot of people happy. That'll, that'll be something I, I think would be worth being remembered for. So, Yeah, I know totally what you mean there. Okay, so we're going to take a brief break and we will be right back. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Now we're back to the second half of our show and we have Sean Pinnock here. We're going to be talking about the future. What does 2030 look like? Now there is no right or wrong answer. So no worries about failure here. It's all subjective. What do you think it will look like five years from next year, which is 20, you know, it's 2024. So hard to believe we're almost at 2030, right? Yes. Um, so when you talk about five years from now, we're talking about the work, the industry, like working it can be jobs. It can be whatever you think the future is going to look like from a very broad <laughs> scale coming right down to games. Well, there's, there's a whole lot there. And I'm, I'm, instead of talking about everything, let's talk about, let's talk about my field of expertise, which is making video games sure. and what that industry is going to look like. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, generative AI is, um, and AI in general is um, greatly impacting the way video games are being made. Um, I can tell you today, right now, mid journey, has sadly um, replaced a lot of jobs in the games industry. There's an entire there's an entire role of working uh, of, of discipline in the games industry that's almost gone overnight. Um, and certainly, still there are some concept artists out there making art, but it's it's one quarter as many um, as there was before. Um, and I think that trend is going to continue to happen. Um, I think it started with concept art and I think 3D modeling is coming next. Mm -hmm. um, I think 3D modeling is, is going to move. Now, there will still be 3D modeling jobs, just like there are still concept artist jobs, but um, it won't be long before we can generate uh, awesome 3D models from text prompts. Um, and um, five years from now, I think is about when we'll see that really coming online as well as perhaps generating animations. Um, and, you know, five years from now, I think it'll be too early, but I think, even some of the work that programmers do will will um, start to come under under uh, I would say automation. Now, certainly more advanced engineering. There'll be there's the people that create AI, of course, right? I think engineering is software engineering is is one of the safest jobs um, in the uh, probably in the world economy because you know they build AI. But AI is coming for for a lot of it, um, and it is interesting to say the least. Yeah, I know that many times when I talk with aspiring artists, they'll they'll come out here. Yeah, I want to be a game artist or a level designer. I said, you know, I can probably get about 10 of you for a penny. So you better be thinking about some other things that you might want to be doing. And right now it can still be rigging, programming, definitely. But with AI art libraries and, you know, AI itself that can create some things, People want more experienced people helping them with art than the entry level. Yeah, I, I, if someone was in school right now and they told me they wanted to be a concept artist, I would tell them to stop. I would say, yeah. don't do that. Like I, I, I can tell you, I mean, we we had five concept artists on staff. These are incredibly talented people. Like you go on ArtStation, these are some of the best people on ArtStation. And now we let four of them go because one of my designers can do all of their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you're an incredibly talented concept artist, Mid journey's better than you. Sorry, um, and it just—I might get some flack for saying that, but it's true. No, it's um, true, and we and it, we really need to prepare people, right? So we need to prepare people. Now there's still work there. Like I still have one concept artist 
but that person was the most talented of those already five very talented people. And that person is essentially, you know, uh, you know, working with AI to make their job go a lot faster. And I think, unfortunately, for the people in the industry and in those roles, it's coming for 3D art next. I mean, you can already generate okay 3D models with AI. You can't generate great ones right now, but you can generate okay ones. And I'd be willing to bet that in five years, you can generate great ones pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I usually guide them <clears throat> in the direction, well, right now you should consider picking up project management because if you can deliver on time, on scope and on budget, you're going to be worth a lot of money at that point in time. And I feel uh like the outcomes... Um, having an outcomes-based mindset is going to be very important when hiring. Yeah, pro project managers, producers are, you know, they're always, they're all, they're, no matter what industry you're in, there's always going to be someone that's responsible for delivering the product. So that is a, that is a role um, that, you know, is always going to be in demand, but certainly engineering is, is the most um, in demand by far in the games industry, right? A, gr a great engineer can, can work anywhere they want. So any mm -hmm. industry. One of the uh, things that I have read quite a bit on is in the HR space and in education. As education becomes less, you know, like it's all going to college, it's going to become more customized. You'll have your own teachers. You'll be able to pick who you want to have teaching you. You won't necessarily be going on a campus. There's so much uh, that's changing in that space. Education is a slow moving beast. Um, HR, on the other hand, um, is going to be very, very much in demand because we're going to have to have more of a customized learning approach to help make sure that people are being competitive. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the future of education looks like. I'm, I'm definitely not the guy to ask that. I can say that um, conversational AI is um, incredibly interesting. Um, you know, chat GPT, I think recently scored like in the 99th percentile, 90th percentile on the bar, which is like one of the most difficult language exams in the world. Um, and I regularly use these programs to teach me things. Um, even though their information isn't always correct, I'll validate from other sources, but oftentimes it's more accurate than the other sources too. So um, I certainly can imagine that these programs could be used to educate people more personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. Um, so if you see that shift happening over here in this space of, you know, art programming, what about music? What about some of the other areas where we see, you know, art, artists are adding value, story writers? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to believe there's always going to be a human touch that makes these things um, stand out, right? Um, you know, th whether it's music or art. But I think that human touch is going to become more and more rare. I mean, even today, like if I'm being honest, and I look at if I look at a lot of music today, I mean, most of it is auto-tuned. It's it's being edited 14 different ways, post-processing, and essentially these are these, I would say most famous musicians are more marketing vehicles than they are actually um, kind of classical musicians. I would say, at least in the the singing sense. Now, not all of them, certainly, but a lot of them, I would say, are more, more so marketing vehicles. They create really interesting content and that people like to watch or see. Um, and I think that trend is going to continue and get even more exasperated. Uh, not that that isn't art, it's just a different way of expressing yourself, I suppose. But um, music, I think we're already seeing examples of it being created by AI in quite impactful ways. Um, people recreating other people's songs from text prompts, but with different tunes. I think that's that's happening right now um but i'm not i haven't dig, dug as deeply into that industry mm -hmm. um, so do you have your own composer and sound effects person we we do have our own um sound effects person that we work with does great work and we, yeah. we do not have our own composer we'll probably work with a composer though hmm. the well there's an opportunity right so you know instead of buying it off of the shelf you know it it really requires i think um I, I don't think AI can do these things where you can say, okay, so what music, maybe you could, uh, how would you lay out the music that would truly tell the story or be in sync with the story of the game? Like, I think that's still hard to do, but maybe, maybe if it I, has the, the whole script, it can understand it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know enough about, you know, generative AI for music 
Um, I think that musicians could probably use the technology to better help their workflow today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Abzu is one of my all time favorite games and they have, it's a short game, two and a half hours long, but it's one of, I would say the best examples of music playing with the game. And you play as a um, avatar who's swimming through the ocean mm-hmm. and there's an orchestra and they, the, the, the team, I think went to a live orchestra that recorded um, multiple compositions and the music changes based on where you are. And it, it's a very emotional experience and it's because of the music. Um, you know, can AI do that today? God, I don't think so, but maybe, I don't know. Not, I haven't dug enough into it. <laughs> yeah, neither have I. And it's all new. So, you know, it's impossible to be able to be well-versed on any of this right now. You know, we're all trying to keep up with it actually yep. as so much comes out. So what do you think about ethical dilemmas that will come up with all of this? Um, obviously oh. we've been talking about hiring people and you know yeah. having to let some people go that's hard yeah it's ethical right it is an ethical dilemma there I, I went through it you know thinking about at the end of the day though it's um i have to build a successful company and um you know we have to make a game we have to do it profitably or else everybody loses their job right it's not just three people it's everybody mm-hmm. and so that's that's how we were able to make that decision um but you know, thinking not just about the games industry and going back to AI um, and ethical dilemmas into the future, I think the, you know, I think a very interesting thing that's going to happen. I think we'll start to see it in five years, and we're really going to see it in I think ten, and that is you know, job replacement and AI as a whole. Like you know, if AI can drive vehicles better than we can, if it can cook basic food better than we can, if it can serve us better than we can, if it can create art better than we can and X, Y, and Z other things, a lot of people are, I think, going to, their jobs will change, they'll shift, but there may be a lot of people that feel lost. Um, And we're going to have to, as a society, figure out how to cope with that. Um, It's going to be an interesting time. I was having a conversation with a gentleman before I jumped into our podcast for today. And he has a premise that if you if a company has to lay somebody off because AI is doing their job, they may not ha- really understand how to use AI. And that that really made me stop and think about that because, yeah, I would say that's true for myself because I don't know enough about it. So how could I make a really good decision as to you know what I could do? He was discussing how AI can come in and to make a, a company really, um, scale very quickly is that you would have employees that have employees. So you can use AI bots to help you do things, whether it's creating a marketing strategy or creating, you know, what is the latest news that I should look at today in HR for myself? Like you can use these, that would be an executive assistant. Um, there's different ways you can create bots that can help you be more efficient. And so that might work well in your marketing strategy, right? Where you're using bots to help you in that area. It might be in the distribution of the game or even, you know, promoting it to whatever the buyer personas are that you have. But I really hadn't thought about that until he had said it. And that would be one way to, I think, ethically use um, AI properly if we're really making sure we're spending more time and how do we keep our people, but yet we're using AI to really improve what it is that they're doing so that we can see better results. I'll connect yeah. you with them. Yeah, I think there's there's some truth there. Um, you know, thinking about going back to the comms artist as an example, like when this technology came about, um, you know, our, the, our, we, our artists use it, right? It's making them, making their job more effective. The, the, the problem, the dilemma right. that we went into was that it was so good and so effective that we had way too much art now. Like, like literally, and in, in one of my designers and weekend created more concept art than my entire concept art team did mm. in, the, in the previous two years. And so, you know, that's obsolete now because now yes. I have all of it I'll ever need. Um, but at the same time, we, you know, we're, we're leveraging the technology. So I disagree with him, um, but uh, we too. are... We, we are we are having our artists use the technology too so yeah. 
Yeah. yeah, I agree also, because I felt like that would be uh, part of part of the discussion as well, maybe in some instances. In some instances, do. certainly. Yeah, yeah, like, you can I, do that. I, I use it currently, you know, in a number of like I use it for myself for a lot of things that you described, like marketing and, and executive assistants, things like that. But I still have a marketing person and an executive assistant. You know, they I couldn't I can't replace their jobs. So at least yeah. not yet. And maybe one day it'll replace my job. Who knows? Oh, That'll be scary. Let's hope not. <laughs> that would be That'll scary. Be scary. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes Wally, the movie Wally. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. What are we? We're little weebles yeah. that sit in a chair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so scary. Um, it's so hard to believe we're coming up on the end of the show here. It, it's really flown. Um, so best mentoring advice that you would want to share with our listeners? You know, I would skip there's two different things I would say to people. Um, I would say the most important thing in life, and this is a little more philosophical, is learning to be content. Um, mm. Even me where I am today, um, like a lot of people could look and say, well, Sean, you have everything. And but there's so much more that I, that I want, at least on like a metaphysical level. Um, but just like sometimes it's good to sit back no matter where you are in life and like enjoy and, and be happy, be grateful for the things that you have. It's probably the, my best piece of advice I could give you. And then the second thing is if, if you want to be an entrepreneur, because I am an entrepreneur and if you're listening here, it might be because you want to be one, whether it's making video games or whatever, it doesn't really matter being a professional athlete. There's probably nothing more important than just pure grit and determination. Um, you're going to fail a lot. Um, you're going to have to get back up and keep going. And the people that are successful are just the people that got back up more times than you did or, or someone else did. So that's all there is to it. You're, you're going to have a new baby here and you already have one. Mm -hmm. So we'll use the analogy there. Think of how many times a child falls down when they're learning <sighs> to walk, right? And they get back up. They don't, always cry they just continue to do it there's probably no not the same kind of frustration that i think adults have because adults have more baggage that they carry with them and they feel that people are watching them i think that's one of the pieces of baggage oh everybody's watching me so now if i fail now i'm a failure to like 10x what i thought right so I love the fact that you said that failure, it's a, it's a good thing. And that was the lesson that you really had to learn because I, yeah. I don't think as grownups, we, we see failure as what it's really meant. It's really meant to be learned. It is. It is. I mean, that's, you know, kids, kids aren't born, you know, some, some other species, right. But in humans, kids aren't born knowing how to walk, knowing how to talk. And they're not afraid of failure, right? They're not afraid to bump their head in the wall over and over again until they figure it out and then learn the next thing, the next thing. And as adults, we, I think we, we become afraid of that, but people don't really care. Maybe, maybe a couple of people close to you may care. And if they're negative and their reception to your failure, then maybe those aren't people you should have in your life. But um, at the end of the day, like we're a small speck in the universe, who cares? Get up there and keep going after it. That's how I see it. So. Yeah, I agree with you totally. Yeah, and don't worry. Don't worry what others think about you. Who cares? Exactly. <laughs> Who cares? Okay, so how can our listeners and people watch this show on YouTube as well as listen? We have over um, 20 plus, I think we're at 26 podcast streaming channels where people find this show. Uh, the one that's the most popular, just so you know, is always uh, Apple. So they find us a lot from there, but there's a lot of people that can find you. So how can they reach you? Yeah. So um, my Twitter at, at Sean Pinnock, my LinkedIn slash Sean Pinnock. I respond to messages the majority of the time on those platforms. So just message me there. Maybe message me twice. If I don't respond the first time you personalize it, I'll definitely respond to you. So. Got it. Yeah. Now we always give the LinkedIn for sure. We always know that's a great way. Um, we'll put your website up there, the Play Avalon, and then we'll include your Twitter slash X uh, handle. Sure. Sounds great. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for being a guest. This has been, it just flew by, it just flew by. You're very good at being a guest, by the way. Oh, thank you. You, you had great questions. It made it easy for me. Huh. <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, you guys have a really good day and uh, good evening. I will talk with you again soon. Thanks, Isabel. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.
The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios. Thank you to our video editor, Max Stein. Our music is by Sophie Lloyd. Visit Employers for Change at www.e4c.tech to learn how you can create real diversity and inclusive culture while skilling your people for the future of work. You can support The Intern Whisperer by subscribing to us on Podbean, our Employers for Change YouTube channel, or follow us on your favorite podcast streaming app.